Well, hello everyone and welcome again to uh, another one of our In Conversations where we've been talking to um, system and uh, thought leaders uh, across the health and care landscape. And we've got a first today, actually. Uh, our guest is uh, not just uh, something of a polymath, but uh, also from an NHS perspective, is on the opposite side of the boardroom to where we normally uh, sit, in that she's a non-executive director. Uh, it is the it is the fantastic, the great uh, Claire. Well, Claire, it's so good to see you. Thanks for finding the time to be with us today. And um, before we start this, we probably ought to say for people watching or listening to this, because I can see us disappearing down a few rabbit holes and people saying, well, you know, why are those two talking to each other like that? We, we've kind of been, we've, uh, we've known each other for a little while, haven't we? I think going back to college, just after about 97, when you became the youngest MP elected at that election, one of uh, Blair's originals, and and you served as MP in what, what I thought was a fascinating constituency. Um, a, a kind of three-way margin, wasn't it, I think, every time you fought at Watford, and then served as a minister. And I think you took, if not the last, certainly one of the very last pieces of legislation the Labour government did uh, through, through Parliament in the form of the Bribery Act. So you've actually got a pretty positive legacy, which is, I think, what can be said for the vast majority of uh, former ministerial colleagues. So, uh, so it's, great to, it's great to have you along to talk to us today. Great to see you too, Richard. And um, yes, we're going back a long way thinking about uh, times in Watford and my various different visits to your former employers. Yeah, great. We can't be old enough to to been that long ago, I don't think. So um, let's say, uh, well, let's get into the um, to your NHS bit. I mean, people will know that uh, I'm an NHS non-exec as well and think, well, how, how did you manage that? Um, so you're coming today from a, a non-executive perspective. And um, I think there's a lot of people who will be, will be, will be listening in today that have probably been, have got a breadth of experience aligned with, but not actually as part of the NHS, that I think would make fantastic uh, non-execs and they just probably never thought it, thought about it or never had any idea. Maybe Claire, just tell us your story, how you ended up being a non-exec at your kind of local trust. Then just say a few words perhaps about Shearwood Forest, not everyone will know it. Then we can perhaps uh, break the news that you are relatively recently, and we're doing this at the end of June 21, appointed as the as a trust chair. And then we can perhaps talk about leadership of an individual organisation in the system world. OK, gosh, we've got a lot to talk about today, Richard. So um, so I, I joined as non-executive director in May 2013. Um, and Sherwood Forest is, as you would imagine, in Nottinghamshire. Uh, it serves a catchment area of um, Ashfield, Mansfield, parts of Newark, um, borders into Derbyshire, borders are across into South Yorkshire and uh, Lincolnshire. Uh, and I'd only moved up to the area in the December before, and I didn't actually even know where the hospital was at first. Um, but I'd heard that they were looking for non-exec directors. And I was really interested and particularly interested because it was a foundation trust hospital. And my previous um, career, as you've already uh, explained, uh, one of the roles that I'd undertaken was as the parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of State for Health, John Hutton at the time, uh, when we introduced the legislation which brought in foundation trust hospitals. So my part of my pitch in the interview at the time was, look, I was there in its formation. I spent a lot of time persuading people that this was the right thing to do. So I want to be part of seeing if it really works. You know, I want to be part of that um, that project. Uh, and I do think foundation trusts work. I think it's um, particularly the opportunity to have governors and to have that uh, democratic engagement um, with the local population is a really important part of what I think is a public service mandate in its broadest sense. So um, what did I offer? And it's quite interesting, isn't it, these days? I think I offered to um, uh, to the board uh, as a non-exec director that potential engagement with the wider public, um, the political antennae and politics with a small p and sometimes a big p is really important when you are a, a hospital trust or indeed just in NHS and in anything to do with the public sector. Um, probably 
you know, a wider understanding of how to work with different organisations. Um, and I also at that point when I joined in 2013 had been uh, working since I'd come out of Parliament around the pharmacy sector, community pharmacy. So um, I think I brought perhaps a, a little element of that to it as well. Uh, and I think, you know, these days we are seeing more women non-execs, particularly in the health service, where there's, I think, traditionally been a lot of women, um, but now across lots of other industries and sectors as well and businesses. But we're also quite rightly beginning to bring in some younger people, um, better representation, not just in gender, but right across um, the, the BAME community um, and in uh, in terms of those who have different experiences of health services, both as as patients and otherwise. So I think I think there's you know, an opportunity for us to to look at. Yeah, the, the NHS and think that um, non-execs are a really rich source of um, experience uh, for, from different sectors and different walks of life that can be brought into this public sector. Yeah, it's great. and there are various routes in, aren't there? I mean, there's a, there's a sort of formal route you can people advertise for non-execs. I know uh, I was kind of, um, I was just approached and asked to, asked to apply and my fragile ego didn't need much more of a massage and then I went and then an interview I just kind of uh, I kind of hit it off with a chair and we went from there and I find myself now uh, chairing a um, chairing a finance somehow chairing a finance and performance committee as well as being the board lead on equality and diversity which has been a really kind of rich uh, uh, personal experience um, so actually when I um, when I had my interview I was uh, I was asked why um, um, why why this trust and why now and uh, my small specialist trust and I said I didn't think I mean, you, you relax when you don't think you're going to get the job I said well you're a basket case and you're too small and too specialised and five years on you know you'll either be part of Julie Moore's empire and Julie was chief exec at the big noisy neighbours up the road up the A38 at uh, University Hospitals Birmingham or you were doing some really interesting work as part of a franchise any either way it's going to be a heck of a journey um speaking of heck of a journey so you've recently taken over there as chair uh, yes. and uh, we're now moving to this to an integrated care uh, uh, system uh, yours will cover Nottinghamshire as I understand it that is going to be a heck of a journey. Our, our chief executive said we're, we're currently we're being we're being told to work as a system, but we're being governed um, we're being governed in an entirely different way altogether. It is going to be a heck of a journey. Maybe Claire, have some thoughts on on that and, and the leadership of an organisation in that system world and what the future might look like generally for ICSs. But if you want to say anything more specific about what's happening in Nottinghamshire, I'm sure people will be interested. So we've already as a trust had a heck of a journey, as you put it. So when I joined in May 2013, within a month, we were in special measures um, and uh, we were one of the Kehoe uh, trusts. Um, so we've had some really challenging times. But uh, earlier this year, we won uh, the HSJ Trust of the Year. Um, we have come a long way in seven years and our staff have done a most amazing job and the culture of the organisation has changed so much in that time. And I see that as somebody who um, I remember being told very early on when I arrived uh, by a member of staff, it doesn't really matter what you do here because you won't be along, around long enough to see it. Nobody ever stays uh, and there'd been such churn. And I think that stability is a huge part um, of what has helped support those changes at Sherwood Forest. Um, in terms of you know, where we go, I'm, I've taken on this role. I'm, I'm the, an interim chair at the moment. Um, our chair was seconded over to Leicester, John McDonald. So uh, another part of, uh, of the Midlands that you'll be familiar with, uh, Richard. And um, and I was delighted, having been vice chair for some years, to step up and to take on that role. I think it's a fascinating time for the NHS at the moment. So we are seeing, obviously, the, the design frameworks come out in the last few days about what the ICS might look like. Um, we've got all of the discussion on provider collaboratives. And I think that what the NHS are trying to do from the top 
is to give us a sense of what's the minimum, but not trying to cap our aspirations and our ambition and our innovation for what we can do at local levels. And I think we are still going through those discussions, both um, at trust level and across the ICS, as to what that might look like. But I'm absolutely certain that, you know, what has to be the core of anything that we do, it's not about organisational egos. It's about raising the standards, delivering for our communities, delivering for our patients, tackling deprivation, tackling issues around population health. Because if we don't make those changes and we don't see those improvements over the next few years, then all of this system framework structure, the architecture is pointless unless it's there to deliver something different. And in the context of COVID and what we've been through uh, as a country, but also as a health system and our staff and, the, and our patients, we know that we've got to change the dynamics. We've got to change the way in which we deliver services, how we work in partnership, how we collaborate with others across the, pro uh, the public sector and indeed those in the broader community to be able to deliver things differently. And that's a massive task. That's really well said, Claire. Actually, I mean, we talk a lot actually in Birmingham about this system working there is um, organisations are going to have to pursue a course of action in the certain knowledge that it's maybe not in their interest of their own organisation, the way we're kind of governed at the moment, but is the right thing to do for a system. And uh, yeah, we certainly think we've done that at our trust and that's going to take courage and leadership. So it's fantastic news. Their trust of the year is a heck of achievement, you say, given where you were a, a few years ago. We actually we were shortlisted for the specialist trust of the year. We're going to we're going to have another go. So maybe I'll uh, I'll put my colleagues in touch and some of the magic will, uh, will rub off. Um, so let's segue from there. It's a really good moment to segue into. I mentioned you've been a bit of a polymath. Uh, before into one of your other roles and um, it, I was really early this morning in the um, in the health service journal about this journey we're under now towards integrated care systems has got to be a bit more than just undoing the Lansley reforms and um, not, not for me to be an apologist for Lansley or any any secretary of state but I, I kind of understood what he was trying to do and I think he was frustrated because he wasn't a conservative secretary of straight state and the manifesto commitment in 2010 to abolish PCTs was a Lib Dem one but I think the mistake he made was throwing a lot of distraction at service at a time when we um, when we knew what was the service was making really good progress had done over the previous decade or so knew what it needed to do next and I think everybody was saying now is the time we need to collaborate and cooperate but what he did he, he he really hardwired and supercharged the market, which is why we're trying to happen to unpick that legislation now. Um, your executive hat, we mentioned you're non-executive, but your executive hat is chief executive of the Institute for Collaborative Working. So tell us a little bit about ISW, ICW, some of your work and how and just some thoughts on you know, how that might how we might you might be able to support some of the collaborative work in industry has with the NHS, because I know um, I know it's a challenge. It's a broad challenge for us at the moment to try to improve that. It's always been a bit of an old perennial how you how you engage the operational bit of the NHS in in all highfalutin policy. And we got very excited. I think we've got a call um, in the coming days with uh, with uh, BSI about uh, the actual inter ISO standard for collaborative working. So some thoughts on that would be great. Ben. OK, yeah, great. So um, the ICW, I think, is still uh, too much of a, a hidden gem from the broader uh, industry sectors um, uh, and business world. So it was established 30 years ago as a joint initiative by the CBI and the then DTI, obviously, uh, like everything else, these these government departments changed their name. Um, but it was established as Partnering Solutions Limited with a, a plan to use it to bring together public and private sector to work together to partner better, um, but also to promote partnering across supply chains. Uh, roll on several 30, 30 years, we've become an institute. We are a not-for-profit, self-funded membership body where our membership is both uh, corporate or organisational, uh, but also individual members who are interested in collaboration and either take part um, through our assessment in our residential course, which we run with Warwick University, 
or through direct entry because of their experience as um, collaborative managers, for example, uh, within business. And the, what we essentially do is we provide a knowledge network um, and a development, so training and development um, for understanding and promoting collaboration. And you mentioned BSI. Now, uh, they are one of our members and one of our key partners. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that um, over the period of time, the work that was done with our members, uh, lots of those key companies who needed to understand how they could work better with their supply chain and with their uh, various different partners and customers, was to build a, a framework, a structured framework for collaboration. And the core of that um, was developed into a British standard and then ultimately into uh, an international standard. So ISO 44001 is the first global standard for collaborative working. And what it does is to set out a structured framework for how you can work together and the steps that you need to take in order to do so. Um, you know, and it, it even includes at the, at the sort of final stages, it includes the exit strategy. And before you start the process of collaborating, you actually decide what your exit strategy is. So it's a little bit like a, a prenup. Yeah. You decide what's going to happen if the uh, if if the end comes and you you decide that uh, you need to divorce. You have to you have to set out the terms. And actually, in many cases, that helps to prevent you um, from getting to that point because you realise how difficult it will be and the consequences of what you lose when you don't collaborate. So we support our members, we learn from them, we encourage them to put their learning and their um, leadership, thought leadership into the pot so that everybody, both uh, not just in the UK, but also globally, can share the understanding and the knowledge of how to collaborate better. Now, we have a lot of um, big corporate members that are uh, companies across defence, infrastructure, transportation, uh, construction industries. Um, and these multinational or, or, or big uh, corporate um, companies uh, are in many cases, some of those are our ambassadors because they are so committed to um, collaboration. Uh, and many of them have been certified to ISO 44001 standard because they see the value that it brings to their relationships. And they tell me that in terms of their suppliers, in terms of their partners across different, dif different parts of the sector, um, they're able to build relationships that are longer lasting, that deliver more value, but also are financially more profitable than collaborative, than, than contracts that are not. So we see we see significant value in that. And, and that's one of those things that, um, we're very keen to to promote and to promote as well within the pharmaceutical sector, but also in the health sector. And that kind of leads us back to our discussion in terms of the NHS. You're absolutely right. Um, here we are with new design framework with a bill going through Parliament over the, uh, the next few months that will include in it a duty to collaborate. And that that's really difficult because Collaboration is not simply how we sit down and work together. In order to successfully collaborate, you've got to have the behaviours, the right behaviours, the right attitude. You've got to want to collaborate, not just be told you have to collaborate. So we're really keen to see the NHS and other parts of, uh, uh, of the public sector understand the best uh, ways of instilling um, the skills in our uh, staff. Uh, of how to work together to get that value. I mean, Claire, that's absolutely fascinating. And uh, I think you said a lot of things there that will chime with a lot of people uh, listening uh, and watching to this today. We have a conversation with with colleagues from ICW and BSI uh, coming up, and uh, we'll be certainly trying to think about how we can incorporate uh, some of that work and some of your work uh, into what we're doing. And we perhaps have to come back and do this again or arrange something for our members to find out a little bit more about. Uh, I said, when we put this out, we'll, we'll stick all the links in as well. I know you've got some awards coming up and all that. 
Um, but yeah, uh, it's uh, it'll be something I think really, really positive uh, we, can, we can latch on to. But as that duty to collaborate comes in and everyone in the service starts scratching their head and says, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? And I think there are some pockets around of what good looks like. Um, Claire, we, look, I can't let you go without talking about politics. Once a politician and all that, it's uh, I, I'm struggling to know what to make of the current political landscape. Um, the government seems to be doing bad things. There seems to be bad smells. And every time you think, well, this is they've really done it this time, they they get a, they get another couple of points at the polls. And um, so the polls look uh, bizarre. They sat on a stonking majority. They seem to be popular. And last week, I must admit, I, I didn't really follow last week. Why would you bother following a by-election in Buckinghamshire um, with, a, a, with a sitting government that seemed to be more popular by the day? Of course, they've got this they've got this vaccination bounce, I think, which we're all grateful to the, to the brilliant vaccination programme that uh, uh, you, which, you, which you have to give them at least in part credit for. Uh, and then they lose. They didn't just lose. They got absolutely hammered, actually, by, in the scale of these things last week. But next week, um, I think... Keir Starmer's probably actually cursing his luck that Tracy Braben actually won the West the West Yorkshire mayoral thing. Uh, the bookies will give you very very short odds on on the Conservatives gaining Batley and Spen. It just sounds like it should be a lay of the sea, doesn't it? What do you make of it all at the moment? I think politics is in turmoil, and I think our traditional um, dividing lines of of who's Labour, who's Conservative, who's Liberal Democrat. Um, have literally been thrown in the air. Um, and I think people are looking for something different. But what we are also seeing is that the traditional seats, um, as you referred to, uh, uh, so Chesham and Amersham last, uh, last week, those traditional heartlands for the um, main parties are also beginning to turn. Um, so I'd say what, uh, what we're seeing from the Conservative Party at the moment is probably to some extent a replica of the uh, the way in which Blair won and held uh, a majority um, back in 1997, which was to try to hold on to his core uh, traditional uh, supporters, but then to make an offering right across into the middle ground, um, which he's done with the, the red wall seats and the north um, and the Midlands, uh, and to make a to make that offer, and he's probably found it a lot easier to do so, because at the same time, um, the Labour Party has had its own problems and hasn't offered um, certainly up until the the 2019 election was not offering uh, an alternative that the British public wanted to take. So I think the the mixture of um, not having the alternative, the opposition. Not having, um, uh, I think, the challenges, uh, particularly around the context of Brexit uh, at the same time, has meant that we are not we are seeing a very different politics and a very difficult, different political landscape. And I think going forward, you know, parties need to recognise that they have to offer change to people's lives that's relevant and they have to talk about subjects that's relevant. And unfortunately, you know, we've got over the last few few years, we've got to a point where much of the conversation is about topics which ordinary people don't feel is going to make any difference to them. Um, and uh, it, it's not grounded. You know, the, the changes that they're thinking about are not grounded um, to to their lives. So. So I think it's an if you're a political watcher, it's a very interesting time. Batley and Spen is going to be very interesting, um, particularly because it's not just about a straight Labour Conservative fight. Um, you've got some cultural, um, religious, uh, faith based politics. You've got um, the left in terms of Galloway as well, potentially taking votes um, away from uh, from the Labour Party. So, so it's a real mess. By-elections, however, are not what you determine governments on. They they send some mood music, but um, uh, there are various cases where Labour lost by-elections and went on to win general elections straight afterwards. So, um, uh, you know, you, you have to take these things with a pinch of salt. It's all about the long game, Richard. 
Yes, it is. And that, but we, we will be fascinated, particularly if, if the tour is going. Maybe just bring that back then to, I meant to ask you this before, but I think this is not a bad place to finish on it, is um, given where we are, Labour Party's problems you've highlighted, good majority at the moment, perhaps back to 97, there's a sense from some people, perhaps I was one of them, that Labour with that majority then could have been a bit more radical, a bit braver in some things. Given we're moving to this integrated care system, we're joining up the NHS pounds. Everybody knows the nettle that no one really wants to grasp and it's being kicked down the road a bit at the moment is social care. Do you think this could be the moment where the government might be prepared to do something brave, radical and potentially unpopular with, with finally grasping that nettle? Um, I hope so, because uh, this isn't about one political party. It's about the political um, the whole of Westminster and the whole of, of, of politics uh, and about the, what's good for the country and good for people. And we have to grasp that nettle. Um, and with hindsight, yes, I think you're probably right. Um, we should have utilised that majority at some point in, in those years to make that huge change. Um, but, you know, I'm not saying for a moment that we didn't do good things because I think there was lots of good things. There was lots of change. And it's always hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You can look back and think maybe we should have done some other stuff, too. Um, but I think that we are at the point now where uh, all of the money being ploughed into the health service is not being utilised in the best possible way if we still can't get social care right. And I hope that um, this collaboration by the health and care partnership boards that we're going to see at ICS level will be a genuine attempt to bring local authorities uh, into working and uh, with the NHS. But also we'll think about how we pull budgets too, because that's got to be the way forward. It has to be patient centred, person centred care. And that care is sometimes health and sometimes it's social and sometimes it's just having somebody else there to support them. And we shouldn't be arguing about uh, the, the, the funding arrangements for that. We need to, to uh, collectively grow up and find a way through all of this and do it across the political parties in a way that's right for this country. Great, Claire, that's been absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. We'll have to do this again. We'll keep people up to date uh with the uh with your work in the institute for collaborative working and everyone will be keeping their keeping an eye out on the fortunes of not only the nottinghamshire ics but also the uh, hsj's trust of the year claire thank you very much for your time love today. to see you richard thanks very much